Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans from across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast, a weekly, turned out to be a weekly endeavor. And uh, later on, as you know, uh, one of the regular on my podcast, Boston, you know him as Austin Ward. Actually, probably know him more as Boston Ward now. He's going to join me. We're going to discuss some of the, some of the uh, situations of the day, some things that could be happening. He's also going to join me to discuss uh, some of the aspects of what my first guest on the show today is going to talk about. I mean, this professor at Ohio State, professor of economics, Trevon Layton, uh, uh, with, with help from an undergraduate a few years ago, putting together the data, named, uh, undergraduate by the name of Stephen Berg, Bergman, uh, he's found some interesting figures you could put next to what, in fact, uh, recruiting stars really mean for universities. Uh, I'm talking about football recruiting. Is it worth it to go after a five-star or a four-star? Uh, is it worth it to try to develop a two-star? Well, some schools have to develop two stars, but uh, the numbers are stunning. I'll just give you a little hint. What they found in their study was a five-star recruit is worth approximately $650,000 <laughs> to the university or to the football program, and uh, which just goes to put in, basically to put in writing what fellows like uh, my buddy Boston, you know him as Austin Ward, Jeremy Birmingham, and all these others, Woody Hayes, you win with people. It goes back to all of that. Wow, Ohio State with Urban Meyer and Ryan Day uh, attack recruiting so hard because there is a payoff uh, for the university, for the team in particular. And uh, we'll get into that. But, you know, we're also going to get into uh, the reason I wanted to segue from that into the next item was the fact that uh, we're going to be talking about the draft how it's going to affect Ohio State players. A couple of five-star, former five-stars right at the top of the list. No big surprise if you look at Trevon Layton's uh, data. But uh, this is the, the week of the big draft. Uh, Chase Young could be the second player taken overall. Jeffrey Okuda could be the third player taken overall. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. On Thursday night, you could have Joe Burrow, Chase Young, and Jeffrey Okuda go one, two, three, based on what experts you're looking at. The, all three of those fellas – we're on the Ohio State football team in 2017. I do believe that's unprecedented territory for Ohio State. It might be unprecedented territory across the nation and around the world. But you know what? Before I bring in my buddy Boston, you know him as Austin Ward. Yeah, I'm redundant there, but that's the way it goes. I'm going to uh, segue into this uh, conversation I had with Dr. Trevon Layton, an economics professor for Ohio State, uh, who had a, it has a study published in the Journal of Sports Economics coming out about what is the worth of recruiting? Is it worth it to go after five stars and four stars? And if you have to uh, sprinkle in some three stars, that's good for you too. But let's get right to that interview and then we'll be back with my buddy, Boston Ward. And as promised, here's Dr. Trevon Logan, who was a co-author of a study that uh, had some eye-opening, in my opinion, numbers when it comes to the impact of major college football players on their programs and on the economies, the finances of a major of a of a major athletic department out there. Uh, and uh, Dr. Devon Logan, about, well, first of all, thank you very much and welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, but let's just hit them with the big number right off the bat. Uh, you you and uh, Stephen Berkman, an undergrad at the time, uh, did this study, and you basically determined that a five-star recruit, and this is through data through what, the 2012 season for like a 10-year span there? Give, give, bring me up to date there. Yeah, we took the data from uh, 2002 to 2012 for um, essentially the universe of college football uh, teams in what we used to call um, – Division One, um, but is now the, the bowl division uh, as it's changed names with the major college football programs. Yeah, and uh, basically what you found was drum roll, please. A five star player up to up to that point was worth about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year to his respective programs, and uh, I think the numbers dropped. I'm reading them now. Uh, uh, Jeff Grabmeyer from Ohio State News uh, Communications uh, sent me this story. He did uh, the four star recruits. Uh, generated about three hundred fifty thousand dollars each uh, a year for their programs. Three star recruits were worth about one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then two star recruits actually reduced revenue by about thirteen thousand dollars a year. You know, it was Woody Hayes who a long time ago wrote a book, "You Win with People," but you really, 
it sounds like you really win financially with five stars, right? Is that what you figured out? Yeah, and so there, there are several different ways you want to uh, approach this. So if you think about, you know, if we were just sitting around thinking about how, how does this work, right, especially as people are talking about how much money um, football players bring into their institutions, the best way of thinking about it is to look at, you know, if you're the, all players aren't the same, and some players are clearly better than others. Some players are much more likely to not play very often, and some players are, are very critical to their team's success. So how do you actually go about thinking about how those players impact the revenue of their teams? The first thing you have to account for is the fact that a lot of the revenue that athletic departments bring in has nothing to do with the actual athletes that are playing in any particular year. They're sharing te television contract money. There are ticket sales that might not be as related to who's playing in particular, et cetera. And so you have to control for all of those factors. Then there's another factor that we just call uh, a school fixed effect, which is um, not to disparage any other team, but look, Indiana is just not going to get the same types of players that Ohio State's going to get year after year. And the question then of Ohio State is that they're always going to have better players than some other sorts of teams. And because of that, they're probably always going to generate more revenue. So the question that we ask is, when Ohio State gets a better player than they typically get, so the year in which they win recruiting battles with Alabama and with Clemson and with other power teams and get that five-star recruit, how much does Ohio State's revenue change? That's the best way of thinking about um, the revenue impact of an individual player, controlling for all of those other factors, which really aren't about that player's impact on revenue. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, Dr. Logan. I mean, you know, it, I mean, some people – uh, you know, we'll, we'll tune out a little bit when they hear you describe, but that's what you have to do when you do a, a, a study like this. You know, it's interesting while you were saying that, uh, I was just thinking every time Ohio State plays at Indiana, it's one of their few almost sellout crowds, you know, every other year. <laughs> so the impact that five-star recruits, you know, recruited by Ohio State have on Indiana <laughs> is uh, actually measurable if you really want to get down to it, you know, them in Michigan and things like that. But real quick, uh, before we get into this a little bit more, uh, what, what piqued your interest on this? Why, why did you decide this, that this was worth studying? Yeah, well, the first thing is, this is a continuation of a project that uh, Stephen and I have been working on for a long time about just some empirical analysis about college football. It's one of the strangest things that we have some really good data about college football, and we have a lot of just so stories and a lot of folklore out there and not a lot of uh, real facts. So the first story study we looked at was looking at the relationship between um, recruit quality and team performance. So if you really are thinking about it, there's, uh, it's almost, um, I guess you would say, a, a devil's advocate question, which is that maybe Ohio State shouldn't really get into these recruiting wars because, you know, we're always going to get good players, but do we actually need the best players to be good, right, to win, say, every game as opposed to winning maybe uh, one or fewer fewer. And it turns out that yes, recruit quality is related to team performance. Getting the five-star recruits, getting more four-star recruits does improve your likelihood of winning more games, improves your likelihood of getting to the best and most prestigious bowls, etc. And then we realize that a lot of this information, financial information, specifically for football, is available um, from the national government, which is collects this information now. And so we could take that same strategy and match it to revenue. And that question was, you know, does it matter financially if you have the best recruits um, uh, relative to sort of your other, otherwise your other performance? And it turns out that that is the case, right? So um, it does have a big revenue impact uh, for a team. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, you know, I mean, because we get into this debate almost every year. I started covering Ohio State football back in 1984. I actually, um, you know, I've been covering, you know, different forms of college football since the time I was like 19, 20 years old, way back in Texas, but uh, started covering Ohio State for the Columbus Dispatch. And, you know, I remember we used to have our own plane back there, our own planes back there. And I remember coming back from a road game that first year in 1984. I, I can't remember the game it was, but as we're landing, uh, coming over downtown Columbus and we're landing, I'm thinking, you know, Keith Byers, man, he was the star running back that year. And I'm just thinking, you know, he is the biggest name in this town right now. You know, looking at the lights and stuff. And just just immediately then I was wondering, what what would this guy be worth on the open market in terms of this was a pro football team and the impact just that one player uh, had, you know, on on just the, the – not just the success of the team, but the financial success of the team. And then past that, the financial success of the, of the uh, Big Ten, of the uh, – of – of 
basically bowl games, the, the attraction that those players have for bowl games when they're showing highlight videos. You know, they're not showing the uh, third and fourth team uh, backup offensive linemen. They're showing like Justin Fields running around and, and uh, Jeffrey Okuda and Chase Young making these ridiculous sacks and stuff. You know, and that's, that's, I've always been intrigued by what they bring. But, you know, there, there is a collective element to this, as you point out in your study, a bunch of five stars together like at Alabama and Ohio State well, of course, they're going to have more success. So does that, does that lessen the individual five stars value, or how do you look at it from that standpoint? Yeah, so th- there are a couple of different ways you'd want to calculate that. So uh, let's use the case of Alabama. They are basically year after year right now getting about half of the five stars that are out there. Um, and th- that's amazing. In, in the data that we have looked at from 2002 to 2012, there's just nobody who has had a historical record like that in terms of winning that many um, highly touted recruits. And I also believe that it still is the case that every five-star recruit that Nick Saban has had at Alabama has been drafted to the NFL. So, you know, when he walks in your living room, it's really hard to say no to him. Um, He wins a lot of those battles and he keeps that team successful. But what you want to do when you're thinking about the effect on finance is control for that. So if on average, uh, Alabama gets four or five star recruits every year, we're controlling for that. And what we're looking at is what happens when you get the fifth. Um, and another thing that matters a lot that you were, uh, that a lot of people have mentioned is, well, why not use the, t- the statistics? Why not take Justin Fields, his touchdowns and his, um, and his uh, running touchdowns, and we can look at his passing yards and we can actually calculate um, his productivity and come up with a QBR for him. Yeah. The problem is there are people like Chase Young who are very important to a football team because of what they're going to do and sometimes what they actually prevent happening. So if you have some amazing defensive backs who are five-star defensive backs, what is it, what statistic are you going to use for them to tell you how valuable they are to your team? So that's why we use these recruit rating services to tell me how good a player was perceived to be at the time that they were recruited, because it's going to do the same for offensive and defensive players. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you know, the numbers of the $650,000 that a, that a five-star that you guys have calculated is worth to a program, was that in 2012 dollars or, is that, or, or did y'all uh, adjust for inflation for now? If you follow, follow my drift there. Yeah, we did not adjust for inflation. So those are the contemporaneous uh, values then. If you adjust for inflation, taking in, now, you, now you're really bringing out the economist in me. So inflation has been a little tamed in the last couple of years. It wouldn't bump it up that much. Yeah. It also depends. And I think what you might have is inflation is not inflation in the sense of what we're thinking about a price index, but the money in college football could increase, which would take up the level of uh, revenue that each team is actually bringing in as they sign new television deals, as we move to the playoff, that increases the amount of money in college football in general, and that could raise the level for everyone. But you know, the Ivy League doesn't have a huge football contract, uh, television contract. The MAC, Mid-American Conference, doesn't. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the television wants to put on there what people want to watch, and more and more, it is, you know, it's like – any like with concerts, you know, it's the big, big stars that people want to see, right? I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, explain that, I guess, to folks. Uh, is, is, it, is, it, is it more than ever a have and have not kind of situation from what you've noticed when it comes to major college football? You know, it, it depends on which way you want to cut it. And I, I do think what is happening is, you know, one of the great things that happens in the NFL is there are caps right? There's a salary cap, there's a draft, and that is designed to create competitive balance uh, for teams year after year after year so that someone isn't always doing poorly and someone isn't always going to win um, a Super Bowl. So there are some structural things in place there that that prevent sort of teams from just winning all the time and being... Yeah, and and keeps them from hoarding, keeps them from hoarding players. Yeah, go ahead. Right. and you can game that system as the, the Patriots have. They, they've really worked that system really well for success in the NFL, but yeah. they don't win all the time, right? In college football, there's really no constraint. You have a, a scholarship limit, 
but there's nothing that can prevent you from getting all of the best players right on your team and winning disproportionately. So there aren't those sort of controls in college football and we could enter and increasingly can enter a world of sort of have and have nots. And by have nots, what that really means is a team that is not able to actually improve itself over time. And that would be the biggest problem. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. Just Ohio State in particular um, um, is, I don't know, it, what, what, I think what your numbers are proving is it is worth the effort to recruit, to go out and aggressively recruit four- and five-star players, which, you know, you know Jim Trussell, uh, uh, you know, all the way back to, the, you know, Woody Hayes, Bruce, uh, Jim, uh, John Cooper. John Cooper took it up a notch, you know, recruiting-wise when he showed up. But then, you know, Urban Meyer and now Ryan Day have really taken it into, into, the, into the next stratosphere as far as Ohio State is concerned from an elite level. And, uh, you know, you keep up with things, I think. I mean, Ohio State's sitting there right now with 16 players committed to its 2021 class. Their number – that class is now – is at the moment ranked number one in the country. There is a clearly a payoff for that is what you have found, Correct. Yes, there's a financial payoff for it. There is a on the field performance payoff for it. There's a reason why you want to win these recruiting uh, battles. At the other end of it, when you really think about it, uh, the money that you might put into winning a recruit, and we looked at this on the expense side, there's no variation in expenses, right? So the five-star recruit gets the same scholarship that a two-star recruit does. They eat Correct. the same food that the two-star recruit does. They get the same training. They get the same assistant coaches. So there's no revenue increase in their expenses. And since they're going to help the team perform better, you really should devote these resources into trying to recruit them because once you offer them a scholarship, it's the same deal that you're offering to every other player. Have you done any cost analysis? So this is, this is like not really what we're talking about. But when that, three, when that five-star shows up and he leaves after three years, are you, are you getting a, you know, just when he's really coming into his own, like Jeffrey Okuda, you know, cornerback this year, this past year, Chase Young, they really came into their own and now they're gone. How much of a hit is that for a program? And you may not have even looked at that, but I think you knew where I'm coming from on that. Yeah, we, we actually have looked at that. I have a project with uh, Zach Kraling, which looks at what you would call cycles in recruiting, which is that when you're very, very good at um, winning a lot of these five-star players, it gives a disincentive for the next group of five-star players to want to go to that school because they know they're not going to play. Yeah. Right. They're not going to play immediately. Right. Somebody, you know, you're not going to displace the best quarterback in the nation, <laughs> no matter how good you are. So, you know, you're going to sit and wait. And that's an opportunity for another school to say, hey, if you come here, you can play right away. So we found a couple of things. One, there are these cycles of recruiting in terms of the teams that win the five star recruits and five star recruits are very likely to play. And they're also likely to leave for the NFL early. Um, and that's a project with Zach Kralin. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I'm going to. I want to. I want to. I want to read about that also. Yeah. Hey, you, you know, I, and I asked you this a while ago, but if you adjusted just roughly in your mind, what would what would a five star a day recruit be worth, uh, in as far as you're concerned? Uh, um, let, me, let me do this uh, 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 more scientifically here for the last. Uh, you want ten years about? Yeah. Yeah. Um... It's going to be somewhere around, say, six or seven percent uh, uh, higher. Um, you know, compounding the the inflation. So if you take this hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, maybe getting up to around six seventy five, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars yeah. today. Um, you know, if you're going from the earliest part of the period uh, to today. All right. Well, that leads us to the question, and the uh, you know, you know, I was going to get to this question. You, you work at, at the Ohio State University. Uh, Ohio State has thirty-six sports, et cetera. Football it generates not just a lion's share, the lions and the elephant's share of revenue uh, for the athletic department. Uh, should college football players be sharing more in the largesse uh, that is the revenue that they help generate? Yeah, th this is a question I don't have an opinion on, actually, because it's, act it's really complicated. Yes, it is. Uh, one question that I always put back to the advocates for paying college football players is, how much do you pay them? 
And when they answer that question, they tend to come up with amounts that aren't tied to revenue. And they also tend to come up with amounts that are uniform over all the players. And I wonder what that would do in a locker room to have players who know that they're more valuable than someone else, but not being compensated in a similar yeah. way. That, that, that would, I think could cause some potential problems. We hosted a panel in the Sports and Society Initiative at Ohio State a few years ago on paying college athletes on just this topic. And there were a lot of experts there who were advocating for paying college athletes, et cetera. But when we asked the actual athletes, none of them wanted to be paid. Some of them thought that it would create issues in the locker room. Some of them felt that they should have a, a fund that would be available to them after they left the university. But none of them were looking for actual compensation while they're being played. And then the other issue, as you mentioned, was is this sharing of revenue. We had players from non-revenue generating sports who said, you know, if we start paying in the revenue generating sports, it's then going to shrink the athletic department by, by necessity. Um, and you're going to really go into a, a system where you're only going to have the revenue generating sports. So what happens with that revenue in an athletics department is it is shared. Now, there are other aspects of this that people have not commented about so much, you know, coaching salaries, for example, administrative salaries for these um, operations, which are also very high, but tied directly to the revenues that these uh, programs are generating. This is a big operation. But the players are obviously a key to that. And the issue of how they're compensated, I think, is much more complicated than the simple sort of pay the players that really be, it gets complicated about how much to pay them, when to pay them, and why to pay them. It's funny because I, uh, interesting, I did a little story with Jordan Fuller, was a safety on Ohio State the last three years. And uh, last summer, I did a little story with him talking about, I brought up those very um, ideas of number one, paying a player, paying players, but then number two, if you start paying players and they all get the like you like we pointed out the same amount, well, eventually it's going to evolve into well, wait a minute, this player is worth more to you than that player, and uh, what would that do to the locker room? And he brought up the uh, this the pretty simple analysis, but pretty in my opinion, uh, salient analysis. Well, the, in the NFL, you've got a locker room full of players who are all making different amounts of money based on how good they are. Uh, you know, as judged by the owners of the team and the administrators of the team, you know, there's a salary cap there, but it's for the team total, not individually what those players make. But as, as you know, you and I could have this, we could talk about this for a long time. I've advocated the idea long ago of putting money away for players. The more they stay at Ohio State, for example, the more they would have in an annuity situation or something like that, to when they left Ohio State, they would have a little nest egg that they could draw on one way or the other. You know, just different ways to, uh, like you say, address maybe sharing that revenue, but not necessarily while you're at while you're a player. And of course, they get stipends now that they didn't get, you know, five years ago or ten years ago. So they're sharing a little bit. But like you, like you pointed out, uh, uh, the better players you get the more money you're probably going to generate, you're, you're sharing in like a Big Ten Network uh, contract and, a, and an overall television contract, but that's based on what you've done to a certain extent in the past, the quality you've brought, the attraction you've generated. And this, but I started, started thinking about that. I go, well, that means Archie Griffin and John Hicks and these guys from the 70s, they helped build up this monster, you know, that, that is major college football. And – these guys are sort of like living off of what help what those guys helped generate many years ago or helped build me. So where do you stop when you start extrapolating who's worth what, right? Yeah, I, I think one thing that uh, we're talking about now in college football and in uh, college sports in general is players earning uh, income from their likeness and from their image, which would probably be related to their quality, right? Yeah. So that would be one way of bringing about some – some equalization. So the question is, there are some revenue streams that are not the revenue streams that I'm talking about in my paper that players could avail themselves to that wouldn't harm the overall franchise of uh, college sports. And in particular, um, especially women's sports and non-revenue generating sports would take a serious hit if we dramatically increase the compensation to the players, say in basketball and in football. Um, yeah. So we, we want to protect those sports and maybe having the players earn in, um, income off of their image and their likeness would be one way to have them compensated while they're playing that doesn't hurt this revenue stream overall. 
Yeah, an image and likeness that would benefit proportionately. Like we're talking about, we started out talking about here a while ago. The five stars who usually end up being stars, most of them. Uh, some don't, but the, the the more talented players, the more attractive players would benefit more from that situation, and that would be, in my opinion, a fairer way of going about compensation uh, without making it a necessarily a communist <laughs> type society, communal society. But uh, you know, you're exactly right, Doctor Love. Hey, uh, last thing, you know, I asked you a while ago. What piqued your interest in this? But uh, where do you think where do you think data like this is going from the standpoint of? Do you think this these kind of things will open more people's eyes to what college football players in particular, but then the athletic department in general, the major college football uh, program in general, is worth to uh, a major college? Yeah, I, I do think it'll start that discussion. I also think that it will help us to start thinking about aspects of college football that we don't pay a lot of attention to. So we know that there's a lot of money in college football, but then the question becomes, well, how much money is in it for an individual player? Or how much revenue do they bring? The other aspect is we know players transfer, but we haven't really studied their transferring behavior. We know players exit early for the NFL, but we haven't looked at how systematic that behavior is. So these are all things that we talk about. And we talk about a lot. We're about to talk about a whole lot of players leaving early when we start talking about the draft but we don't think about it systematically. So I think when we move to these discussions, particularly if we wanna inform policy about um, athletes and about amateur athletics, it really behooves us to want to have some data to back up those statements. And I think that's where this is moving more generally. And that data is out there and it's available. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming on here, Dr. Logan. And uh, what I'd like to say is you've kind of opened, in my opinion, a can of, not just a can of worms, the can of gold worms. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, like you say, you hear these debates all the time. You know, you even ask a player, what are you worth? You know, they can't ever tell you. They just know they're worth something. They, but, they, you know, they never, they rarely ever give you definitive numbers uh, in the sense, because I'm not sure they even understand it. But then they also understand, you know, the five-star, if the three-star, if a, if a three-star guard misses a block, a five-star quarterback can get knocked on his butt, you know, and uh, they understand they're kind of all in the same thing together, right? I mean, that's the thing, the interesting thing about football that sets it apart from almost any other sport, right? It's very much a team, a team sport. And players are, should be rewarded in some instances what, what is happening and also what, what they prevent happening. And that's really important in football. Gotcha. Dr. Logan, thank you very much for coming on with me, man. Uh, a professor of, uh, in economics at, at The Ohio State University. And uh, like I said, I was put onto this story by my buddy Todd Jones and then Jeff Grabmeyer from the Ohio State News Bureau. And uh, this has been quite interesting. I'm going to get back in touch with you later um, later on for another podcast. And we're going to get a little more in depth about a couple other things I want to talk to you about. But Dr. Logan, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Have a great time. Thanks. And as promised, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back. That was an interesting conversation with Dr. Trevon Layton, uh, economics professor at Ohio State. And uh, uh, no big surprise to you, though, Boston, that uh, – a five star, yeah. Some five stars, some five stars implode, but a lot of five stars bring a lot of uh, a lot of financial, economic uh, stability to some major programs around the country. Yeah, and it's not it's not even really a risk reward proposition. The way like I, this always comes up the week of the draft, like oh look at all these three stars who became first round draft picks. Yeah, well, there's a yeah. lot more three stars to pick from. You look at the success and the hit rate for these five stars, it's not an accident. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the exact number is going to be for this draft. Uh, just the anecdotal evidence for Ohio State, when you talked about Akuda and Young and uh, you know, prime four-star guys like J.K. Dobbins and Malik Harrison and go on down the list, I mean, these guys are four- and five-star recruits for a reason, and then you give them that Ohio State development. Those guys almost always become – uh, the kind of NFL players that you want. It's, it's been a self-fulfilling prophecy for the Buckeyes. But, yeah, it seems, it seems like a no-brainer. I think it's a fascinating study uh, that the, the amount of money that they're bringing in, but it's also clear you would rather have four- and five-star players than two- and three-stars. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, one hand washes the other. That's especially vital in this COVID-19 era. But one hand washes the other when it comes to recruiting. The better players you recruit, the better football team you're going to have. Now, then it comes down to coaching and putting all, putting all those pieces together. Uh, but uh, 
you know, there's evidence of just the, the, the not, it's not even anecdotal now, it's fairly proven, the evidence around the country. I mean, when you look at Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, uh, or Georgia, right up there, Oklahoma, uh, you know, Texas, it looks like it's bouncing back. We'll see. I always bring them up because I know what kind of talent's in the great state of Texas. But LSU, I mean, look at the players coming off of that team. Now, Joe Burrow, let's face it, Joe Burrow was almost a forgotten man in a lot of circles. But I think it was a consensus three-star coming out of high school. But that's just – I think I feel, I think that was a failing more of the rating services than it was a three-star uh, coming out of nowhere, if you follow I me. Mean, sometimes they don't pay attention to to some players who maybe deserve it, but it's, sometimes it's hard to judge players based on who they're, who they're playing against. And uh, that, that might be more the instance when it came to Joe Burrow, right? Yeah, I think that that's – when we're talking about these star rankings, it's not like they get all of the college coaches around the country to evaluate the tape and submit what star they are. But that would be a right. much- That'd be a much better system. So there are. It's not that it's flawless when you have all these scouting services putting it in there. And, you know, two four seven sports is is putting it together in the aggregate to let you know what what the average is. Like, it's not perfect because you don't have somebody in every town who's a qualified scout uh, or even cover, covering every team around the country. It's just not going to be perfect. Right. And you don't know. You know where all they work out, where all their information comes from, and you have to take into account you know, the, the level of football um, that they're playing, that gets difficult when you're not in the hotbed sort of states like uh, Ohio, Texas, Florida, California, um, you know, Louisiana, wherever. Uh, it can be different. And even in Ohio, you're not – it's not all going to be the same. What Joe Burrow was doing in Athens, uh, you know, maybe people had doubts about how that would translate. And in some respects, that was fair because he wasn't a no-brainer superstar – Heisman Trophy winner when he arrived at Ohio State. He was, you know, he would have fit more into that category where you talked about uh, developing not a two-star, but a three-star before he became someone who was worth $650,000 or even more on Thursday night. So it's, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it is, there are, the evidence is mounting. And this is another piece of it that it's definitely the right way to approach a team is to, believe the star paintings and try and develop those guys as much as you can. Yeah. And I give it up, you know, I give it up to Tom Herman still, cause Tom Herman, you know, basically stood on the, uh, stood on the soapbox and, you know, in essence demanded for one of another term that Ohio state signed uh, Joe Burrow way back when over a kid from California, that a lot of people, a lot of people like, and one of the reasons you like that kid from California is because he was from California <laughs> and uh, played against pretty good competition. But, uh, Tom Herman saw something in Joe Burrow right off the bat that he, you know, he he demanded that uh, that they sign him and uh, kind of didn't really put his career on the line about it. But uh, it turns out that uh, Tom Herman was correct about Joe Burrow and his potential. But you know, it's always about how good you are, how much you develop, and then the opportunity comes along for you get to prove yourself. Some guys like Trevor Lawrence get to do it right out of the box. Justin Fields had to wait one year to prove himself. Uh, Dwayne Haskins Jr. had to wait a couple of years. Joe Burrow had to wait three, you know, before he finally got a starting job. And then he was like a little above average in 2018. But in 2019, when it all came together, it coalesced, as the old saying goes. And uh, and then great players around him rose up. You saw what happened. And now on Thursday night, Boston, kid's going to be probably the number one player taken in the in the 2020 draft, it's going to be a strange draft. It's going to be conducted kind of like you and I are conducting our podcast right now via vidcast. But uh, like I pointed out earlier in the uh, in my opening, you got a chance of three players from the 2017 Ohio State football roster being the first three players taken in this draft, Joe Burrow, uh, Chase Young, defensive end, and Jeffrey, Jeffrey Okuda, uh, cornerback. They could go in you know, succession to the Bengals, the Redskins and the Lions. That's crazy talk, isn't it? It's uh, it's hard to really wrap your mind around it, especially you know a lot of people are, are starting to look at this and try and apply some revisionist history because you you referenced them all being on that same team a couple of years ago, and the spring camp battle with Dwayne Haskins or not being able to beat out JT Barrett before that. I I think it's important you reference this. Even 2018, Joe Burrow at LSU was not somebody who was on the draft radar. I don't know if he, where he would have been selected 
if he had decided to say to you know come out after 2018 and not go for his senior year down there and, and break all every record known to man and win the Heisman like wait let me interrupt you 60 touchdown passes ladies and gentlemen a national championship and a Heisman trophy go ahead yeah it, it, like this didn't just it wasn't like everyone knew from the start even as you said going back to to Athens that you know this guy was going to become that and he could be a number one pick and it's not even fair to look back two years ago and say oh well if he had if if Urban Meyer had and Ryan Day had just taken Joe Burrow over Dwayne Haskins that could have happened at Ohio State maybe it would have and I was a person who said during that spring battle that uh, a I thought Dwayne Haskins was the choice going to be the choice uh, needed to be the choice but that Joe Burrow was good enough to continue you know to, to lead Ohio State to a Big Ten championship and who knows what could happen from there but I thought that the upside was greater and even on Thursday night when the fact that Dwayne Haskins didn't go number one overall and Joe Burrow likely is some of that too is, is circumstance with the way you know the draft worked out and now the who amount needs of what? Tape. yeah who needs what yeah. yeah now the amount of tape that Burrow has and uh, the fit even with Cincinnati all these other things play into it and it I it's been frustrating like because Urban Meyer talked about this on a couple platforms last week and thinking back about having those guys in the same room and you know the amount of information that they processed and, and they would have loved for that Burrow Haskins battle to continue out into training camp in August because those guys are both so talented and it's hard to, they're both first round draft pick quarterbacks it's it was hard to pick between them but this doesn't necessarily change the, the, the course of history and that Ohio State got it wrong because I don't believe they did. But it is a tribute to Joe Burrow's work ethic and the opportunity that he had, and he made the most of it. And he deserves all the credit for that. But as you said, having all three guys coming from Ohio State, and they, they can't fully claim Joe Burrow, but the fact that they were on that same roster and, and all recruited by Ohio State and developed by Mickey Murray for some period of time, it's absolutely bonkers. Like, I, I don't – I don't, I'm struggling to come up with something that's even similar to it. Yeah, I noticed that, but uh, uh, that's okay. I mean, that's what you get paid by. This was for the podcast. A podcast <laughs> gives you time to delve into your uh, memory bank and come up with a proper word. Uh, amazing is still the word I would use because it's still, no matter how you go about, you know, we just talked about the, the importance of recruiting big time players and the, the, follow that with the importance of spotting talent and not being afraid to sign it even though some people are saying, well, he's not a five-star. You know, that's the case with Joe Burrow. Chris Olave is a great case. You know, you're going to see him rise. I mean, uh, uh, J.K. Dobbins was a four-star. A lot of people wanted him, but, uh, you know, he got hurt first play of his, uh, of his senior year in high school, and a lot of people forgot about him. J.K. Dobbins will probably be the next player off the board for Ohio State. I mean, all he did was set a school record, a season school record, beating, uh, you know, breezing past uh, Keith Byers and breezing past uh, – Eddie George, one who should have won the Heisman, one who did win the Heisman, you know, and uh, J.K. Dobbins. I mean, wow, you know, and, and his great football is still ahead of him uh, right on down the line. I mean, Malik Harrison was a big-time player from in from in town, you know, from in Columbus and Ohio State. I'm not sure, sure they took a chance on him. I mean, they 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 recruited him late, if you remember, or signed him or got got a commitment from him late. But you know he might be the next guy off the board. Off the board after that, then Devon Hamilton. Who knew about Devon? You know, Devon Hamilton was a in a lot of people's minds was a project, right? A little bit. Uh, but uh, you know, he could be the next guy off the board. KJ Hill was a four star from when he signed with Ohio State on signing day way back when. That was a big get for Ohio State. Uh, I think it was the same signing class as Joe Burrow. So uh, you know, it's like. Uh, you know, he's from Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas. So uh, these guys come in. But that's why, the, that's why they beat the bushes. They recruit their rear ends off at big places like Ohio State, Alabama, and Clemson because there's a payoff. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned there with, with Devon Hamilton, and I would throw Damon Arnett in there as well. Like, yes. They were not the – those guys were not the most highly recruited. But you can't – it's, it's going to be impossible anymore to – or ever – to sign 25 five-star players. That doesn't exist. Um, and if you disagree with what I said earlier about uh, or agree that the rankings are sometimes flawed, you sometimes have to trust your own gut there, which they did. You know, Hamilton, they got to know him pretty like – he's from Pickerington. It wasn't going to be that hard for them to get evaluations from him. You know, Arnett was a, one where you have to trust you – know, Kerry Combs knows what he's looking for and what he wants. Yeah. It took a long time before, he, before Arnett became that guy who – 
Jeff Okuda is standing on a table and saying, why is he not being talked about as a first-round draft pick, which a year ago at this time people would have laughed uh, their heads off, even if that potential was was clear. You and I have talked about that before, that you know they, there was sort of a lost gap year with the coaching, and that hurt Damon Arnett. And then you throw him in there with Jeff Halfley, and suddenly he's back on that upswing. Um, so that's a reminder then of the importance of coaching. You give somebody with, you know, that you see an intriguing prospect like Devon Hamilton, and you put him with Larry Johnson, boom, what happens? Jeff Halfley and Damon Arnett. I'd go back uh, to another kind of local product where I remember Luke Fickle fighting over and over and over for Darren Lee to get a shot. Yeah. Sometimes that it's people have a hard time with their evaluations because coaches know what they can project, what they want, and, and can turn them into those next guys. I mean, those are three really good examples just off the top of my head of, of three stars that Ohio State can develop, and they don't always have to be four and five stars, but generally those people have uh, a head start when you're going into something like getting ready to become a professional. Yeah, this could be an interesting uh, interesting, interesting three days of a draft for Ohio State, uh, you know, because Jonah Jackson, obviously a one-year wonder <laughs> from Rutgers, uh, transferred in. I mean, uh, you know, I think he's proven himself as a possible third round, second, third, fourth round pick. You agree? And then you got, uh, but then you got Jordan Fuller. It was a big time get when Ohio State got, you know, signed him a few years ago. And uh, what was it, four years ago? And and uh, he kind of drifted down a lot of the draft boards because he ran a, a subpar 40 yard dash in uh, in Indianapolis. And yet, you know that this guy was usually in the right place at the right time for the Ohio State defense, especially last year after they went to that one high safety look. I mean, he was a guy that put it all together in front of him and uh, rarely, rarely was out of position himself. And uh, so I think uh, some smart team may jump up there and take him earlier than some people think because, you know, just because you ran, you had a bad 40 time, you know, at this point, when you're Ohio State, when you're coming from Ohio State, you're coming from, from Clemson, from Alabama, you've got video of playing against teams at the highest level. Right. How did you do in those games? That, that video does not lie. And I think Jordan Fuller looks really good in a lot of the big game videos for Ohio State. And I think, you know, another guy that you and I talked about a lot last year who didn't get as much national acclaim as maybe he could have. He played on any other defensive line, Jay Sean Cornell. Uh, yeah. He's just falling through the cracks. I don't understand that. I don't understand this. He, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, he and Brandon Bowen both. I could not believe that they didn't get invited to the combine. Um, you know, maybe you just have so many defensive linemen. Maybe that's harder for Cornell. Although I think that you, you look at his production, it was really pretty phenomenal what Ohio State got from him last year. Yes, it was more. So that was that was eye opening. And but Bowen in particular, and the guy started all year for one of the best offensive lines in the country, one of the an undefeated team until the college football playoff. Never had any issue where people were, you know, oh, here, here's the weak spot for Ohio State, go to right tackle. That never, ever happened. Um, and so Bowen had positional flexibility, having played guard, started at guard, started at tackle for Ohio State. He's got every everything you could want physically with that massive frame, can move. Um, the fact that he didn't get to go to, to Indy, I thought was was kind of hard to understand. Yes. And – he had, you know, he didn't get a pro day. So it's the same thing with, with Cornell and Robert Landers. Um, Rashad Berry. Yeah, with his yeah, physical right. tools. Um, you know, those guys got kind of a raw deal. Like a lot of people in this country did. Um, not trying to make it more important than others. But for them, this is their first chance at a professional livelihood. And it, it's a, we've talked about this a number of times. That was a massive setback for them. And I think – if teams are smart, NFL teams on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, they will err on the side of it's better to take an Ohio State player because, as you said, they've played in big-time games and you have all this film of them against light competition or elite competition. Um, and I, I hope that that, you know, works in their favor, having got to know them and their opportunities that are ahead of them. I think they deserve – uh, the chance to go prove themselves at the next level, yeah, yeah. especially the ones that didn't get to go to those pro days or, or, or combine. But, you know, maybe that'll work in their favor this week that when it comes down to it, and if teams don't have as much information as normal, they just say, uh, that guy went to Ohio State and that guy didn't. And let's take the New, the New Orleans Saints blueprint and let's just take all the Buckeyes we can get. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, or take this guy from Wyoming. Um, <laughs> well, Logan Wilson. Well, as I like to say, the great thing about taking a guy from Wyoming is downhill all the way to wherever he's going. <laughs> but uh, that's another story. That's a, that's a geographical oddity. What a geographical oddity. Anyway, right in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no, but uh, but you're right. I mean, Brandon Bow is a great example. I mean, he had a five-star nipping at his heels going into preseason camp last year. We talked about the worth of five stars, right? Nicholas Petit Freer, he held him off, became the starter. You know, was the bonafide starter. Uh, that's a great example. I mean, Rashad Berry, I told him three months ago when we did our little uh, requiem to a season, you yeah. know, at the, what was that? Uh, where, where was it? Where did we do that? Landgraf. Land Grant, Land Grant uh, Brewery, uh, I told him, I thought he's the kind of guy that's going to either get drafted or is going to get signed by somebody. He's going to, he will be in the league this season. If in fact there is a this season, <laughs> that's another story, but, uh, but you're exactly right. And then, you know, uh, the Joni Jackson though, that, that guy's intriguing to me, man. I, 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 you could have the way I've looked at it, you could have like six or seven Buckeyes taken perhaps in the first three rounds, depending on what a team is what teams are seeking, et cetera. But Damon Arnett, I just wanted to touch on him because I didn't get to talk about him a minute ago. You brought him up. I mean, think about him playing last year and the plays he made with one hand. Yeah. I mean, there was that one knockdown. I can't remember the game. It was later in the season where he chased a guy, got around a little fade. He chased a guy and then twisted to knock the ball down with his good hand. Do you remember this play? But, I mean, there aren't three people in the country that can make that play. It was crazy, and I'm just going, you're right. I mean, this guy, this guy's upside finally showed, and it's only going to get better. I mean, he, you just watch him. When he got confidence, the comp, when he played with confidence, he was a different player. Yeah, and it, it, it's one – the off-the-field confidence was always there for Damon. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm just talking about when he – yeah, you're but, exactly right. But there, <laughs> yeah. And he was and – and even on the field, he was still a trash talker, but you could – there was a clear difference in the on-field confidence, the trust in the technique, the trust in the scheme, the system with Jeff Halfley. Like, that, yeah. was, that was clear. Um, you know, he obviously got to work with Kerry Combs earlier in his career, and, and that helped. Uh, and I don't mean to, to pile on Tabor Johnson, but there were – like, even Jeff Okuda didn't look like Jeff Okuda that year. Yes. Everyone wondered if these guys were, you know, ever going to stop committing pass interferences or – Hey, 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 let me interrupt you. $650,000? I don't <laughs> think so. No, you're right. I mean, that's exactly right. But we've seen that. You know, I've seen – we've seen – this is what – this is the – I brought this up, as you noticed, with uh, Dr. Dr. Layton. Is like the funny thing about it is, though, how do you value a five-star who finally – everything comes together for him like it did for Chase Young last year, like it did for Jeffrey Okuda, but now they're gone. You know what I mean? I mean, they're gone after three years. That's that's the problem. You got to use them, you know. And uh, but you're right about Okuda. I mean, he he, you know, you we wouldn't have been having this conversation a year ago about him being among the. I think he could possibly be the best of all the corners that have that have been part of this phenomenon of Ohio State DBU. He could end up being the best because on top of just watching his confidence just explode last year. Uh, he's got all the tools. Do you agree? Yeah, and <clears throat> he had not played like a raw pick, um, you know, at this time last year. He right. had a great performance in the Rose Bowl, and you watched him physically, and you go, well, that's the game all the scouts are going to talk about into this next year. Because even going back to his recruitment, people said this guy is the next first-round pick for Ohio State. He has everything you could possibly want. But through two years, it, you, the production wasn't there. I mean, he didn't get his first career interception until this season. And I know that that's not the only way you can evaluate <clears throat> cornerbacks, but that's a pretty big part of it. Um, it's not the teams were afraid to throw on Jeff Okuda for the first two years. You know, he would have had some opportunities, but he was trying to get into the lineup. And, you know, I've said this, <clears throat> it doesn't happen overnight for everybody. But you just you always knew at some point that that, that flip was going to get switched with him or you expected that it would. And he had one year where he was the most – the fact he didn't win the Thorpe Award is absolutely insane to me. Yep. He was the best defensive back in America. That's going to be validated, I think, on Thursday night. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's just a fascinating thing to think about. I'm glad that you kind of tied this all together with the week of the draft because 
Chase Young walks on campus. I, I'd barely ever seen anybody like him in my life. You're watching Jeff Okuda move the first time that you see him in a, in a training camp practice or a spring ball. You're like, whoa, it, it, those physical tools, if you, can, if you can get all the other things moving in the right direction, that's yep. really going to be something. And J.K. Dobbins, watch him the first time he plays a game at Ohio State, and you have no idea. I, I, I really didn't follow his recruitment that closely. You and Byrne did much more than I did. Somebody who didn't play his senior year was not getting a lot of thought for me that well, if, if Mike Weber is hurt, this guy is going to play at Indiana. I, like, I didn't know that much about him on that night, if I'm just being totally honest. And then he explodes, but you see him that first time, and you know that there's something different about him. I, yeah, I, had, I had inside knowledge, though, because my, my younger brother, Tony, has a week, we call it his weekend ranch. He'd love to live there, by the way. Outside LaGrange, he watched him play in high school as a, uh, as a, as a well, freshman, sophomore, and junior, you know. And he, 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 he said he, the rumor was they're going to be expanding the airport runway there in LaGrange, Texas, <laughs> just so the Jets from Alabama and Ohio State and everywhere could be, would be able to land there without having to go to Austin or Houston or something. But, uh, but no, you're exactly right. But hey, let's jump to something here real quick. But, uh, you know, and this is what's interesting. Uh, you know, you roll the dice, not, not really roll the dice, but you go after, you try to accumulate these galaxy of stars. And like you, were, like you and I were talking about before the show, there's a good chance that they, uh, that by the time people are listening to this, it could be a four-star, former four-star player transferring from Ohio State. you want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, so obviously this is not uh, recorded live for your viewing pleasure. Um, maybe uh, the news will actually be confirmed in the transfer portal by the time you're listening. Uh, but uh, Letterman Row sources had told me early on Monday morning that uh, Jalen Gill had informed the coaching staff that he would be entering the transfer portal. I think if you went down a list of possible outcomes – um, as Ohio State goes through this roster management portion, Jalen Gill was a name that would have uh, come up for a lot of you as wondering what his future was going to be. And it is going to be uh, not at Ohio State moving forward. And that's like the other problem, not even problem, the other situation that you have when you recruit so many four and five stars is trying to get them all on the field. And, you know, there are lots of things that can go into that in a player's development. And for Jalen Gill, it just didn't connect through two years. I, he is somebody, especially if you look through the, the archives on Letterman Row, I thought he was a, a breakout star in the making last Me spring. Too. Me too. I, he, looked, he looked phenomenal. And he has those physical gifts that make it easy to assign him a four-star ranking when you're in high school for these scouts that go do that. He looked that part. And I wrote about him probably a dozen times before it got to the season. And it, it just became – clear that it wasn't going to – he didn't really have a role and Ohio State couldn't find a way to put him in that rotation. But somebody is going to, I think. Um, it didn't work out at Ohio State. And Let me interrupt something before you, before you finish up that. I think Ohio State could have played him more last year. They got kind of infatuated with K.J. Hill, what he was bringing to the program. The J.K. Dobbins, the running attack came back with J.K. Dobbins and Master Teague the third. Uh, it's almost like he became – I'm talking about Jalen became almost a forgotten guy and forgotten is, is almost a spare tire that you never have to use, you know? And, and I thought that was unfortunate for him because he flashed a few times last year, if you remember in certain games, I mean, they run down the, they were catching run down the sidelines in one particular game. I, I'm drawing a blank on what Rutgers. game that was. Rutgers, yeah. 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 But I mean, but the point was you can see an upside there, but sometimes you just kind of get stuck in a in a pecking order and then that position isn't necessarily used in the way it was envisioned maybe in the spring right. and you don't play and it's got to be frustrating as well you know because I don't think anybody's saying he's the next this that, that or the other but he I think he has the wherewithal to be a pretty good football player yeah and I thought that that some of the jet sweeps and the, the you know the pop pass that that was going to be a bigger part yeah, uh, offense to, to help ease Justin Fields into it. But, you know, the other part of you talked about J.K. Dobbins in the running game. Well, the other part of it is that, that Justin Fields didn't really need easy yardage or a bunch of help. And so what Ohio State wound up finding more of is throwing outside the hashes and, and letting Fields go deep and show that touch and, you know, relying on K.J. Hill in the slot more than somebody who would be the runner. Um, you know, maybe if – 
maybe if Jalen Gill had actually, you know, uh, lived up to the Paris Campbell comparisons I made, maybe you think about something differently with the offense. Uh, like Ohio State would have obviously been using Paris Campbell if it had him last year. Um, yeah. But, you know, and there's no reason that Jalen Gill still couldn't become that somewhere else because he has physical tools and maybe a little bit of adversity will help him realize that elsewhere. But Ohio State's also in a place where they have all these other four and five stars and they just signed the most decorated class of wide receivers in school, maybe college football recruiting history. Yes. You know, the, the, the patience for both the program and for someone with Jalen Gill's ability is not going to be the same with these guys because as you – the theme of the whole show, he has, he's worth several hundred thousand dollars potentially to himself and to another team. And if Ohio state's not using him, Jalen Gill has to find somebody who, who could for his own personal benefit. And it's just all this stuff leads me to that point where you wonder why they're not reaping any of these benefits themselves. I know that that's a, a whole other can of worms, but there's so much money tied up into this. We've, you know, that's why there's going to have to be a football season played, uh, not to beat the dead horse that we've talked about every single week. But when these guys have these opportunities, like it makes sense. It's not that nobody believes Jalen Gill can be a star. Uh, it's just it's not going to happen at Ohio State. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have more conversations about what players are worth and you know whether they should share in a large yes. But you know what, this isn't something conversation that started yesterday or or two years ago or whatever. I mean, like I brought it with Dr. Layton. I mean, you know. You could say, well, what was Archie Griffin? What, you know, what, were, what was John Hicks? Uh, what were those guys worth back in the 70s to a program in building and maintaining it? What was Chick Harley worth? Well, Chick Harley was worth, what's, what's Ohio Stadium worth right now? $300 million, $350 million? Because that's the house that Harley built. You know, these players have always been, always been worth something. And, uh, but don't discount – the value of getting a college education paid for and getting a degree, that's worth something also, uh, right. you know, uh, but, but then past that, yeah, when it comes to major college football and the way it's played now and the, and the, uh, the money that's generated by it and you're putting your life limb and joints on the line to maintain that, then maybe you should be sharing a little bit more into it. It's just interesting that somebody was able to put a value on what a five-star and like, like he said, you know, for inflation, you'd probably pump that up over $700,000 now, uh, what a five-star is worth. This was a study that was done between 2002, 2012, I think, where the numbers are 2014. But uh, just add in, you know, the Big Ten Network and what it's generating now and the, the next round of TV contracts that some of these major conferences will be signing, you'll see what it's worth. Because, you know, you know, yeah, they put the coaches' pictures up there, but they also put the highlights of Justin Fields scrambling <laughs> left and throwing the ball, you know, after being down, down for the count, you know, two plays earlier, he comes back in against Michigan and has a Heisman moment, you know. That's what puts fannies in seats both in the stadiums and in, in front of television sets, right? And that's why uh, Ryan Day and Brian Hartline and Kerry Combs and Larry Johnson – Al Washington. That's why these guys are paid so much money. Kevin Wilson. Forget, yeah. Don't forget Kevin Wilson. Well, yeah, never never mean to overlook Kevin Wilson. That's why they're paid, um, you know, really a ton of money at this point to identify the four and five stars because yeah. it, it fuels the whole enterprise. That's why we're watching. And if, uh, if Ohio State was winding up with nothing but two and three star guys to develop, I'm not sure that there would be 105,000 people in that uh, house that Harley built. You know what's interesting is uh, the four and five stars, they jump out at you. Like, you don't need the Hubble Space Telescope to spot those guys. But for the three stars, like we were talking about, about Joe Burrow, you know, but, you know, I think Chris Olave, was he a three star? I can't remember if he was up to four, at least when they were looking at him. He might not have been even that high, but they discover that guy. You know, it's like uh, that's where you need the Hubble Space Telescope or the recruiting thing because it is a mix and match. But without a doubt, the more four and five stars you recruit, the more room you have for error from the sense that some of those guys may not be that, but a lot of them turn out to be that and more. And they're going to, you're going to see that pay off, you know, uh, on Thursday night, Friday night and Saturday for, uh, for these Ohio state football players, Chase Young, Jeffrey Okuda, JK Dobbins, Malik Harrison, Devon Hamilton, KJ Hill, Damon Arnett, uh, Jonah Jackson, Jordan Fuller, perhaps Brandon Bowen, Rashad Berry, BB Landers. Who am I leaving out? They'll leave someone out. Austin Mack, Ben Victor. Austin Mack. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Uh, when you start naming them, you leave people out. That's the way it is when it comes to Ohio State. Just like when last year we were talking in preseason about different players, about wide receivers or, or people, and I would always inevitably leave out K.J. Hill. For, you know, just because he's a given, you know what I mean? It's like uh, you got your shoes on, right? Yeah, I got my shoes on. You know, you don't think about it, right? Yep. But, uh, yeah, with your shoes on, you can go places. That's what they do with K.J. Hill. Hey, uh, Boston, always a pleasure, my man. And uh, – uh, I'll be, be interesting. We'll be back next week to talk about where these guys go and the impact, et cetera. But uh, then we'll be projecting a little bit more. Notice we hardly talked at all about COVID-19 or the coronavirus this week because really, even though there's a lot of people are champing at the bit to, to open stores and get back to business, you know, some people are being really impetuous here, you know, and, uh, and I, I think you really, you got to still kind of sit back and let this thing work itself out, right? Yeah, that's that's sort of where I'm at. So if I can help it for for a while and keep uh, Liberty home from daycare for an extended period, you know, we're going to try to do that. We'll see what happens and uh, what next steps they actually take. If they're going to relax it when May first comes around, um, I, I, I'm just at this point get prepared to stay inside for a while and let it it go. I know that not everyone's in that same situation and they want to get back out and back to work, but. I, I continue, as I've said, every Monday here, whatever it's going to take for there to be college football, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So if that, if they, if there are still people that say you should be inside, or if you're going out, you're wearing a mask, then I'm probably going to stay inside and I've got a mask and I, you know, I'd rather not wear it. It's not the most comfortable thing. So if the alternative is to stay in for a little bit longer, that's what I'll do, but we'll see. I, I'm going to, as, as Ryan Day has said, as Gene Smith has said, as a lot of more intelligent people than me have said, you got to trust the experts and listen to what they're saying. And I'm going to follow instructions here. Yeah, I think Gene Smith, I mean, you know, has been a little bit of a beacon here as far as like the way it should be conducted. I mean, you let the people who are supposed to be experts on it. You let them make the proclamations. You let them do their jobs and then you follow suit. Uh, but you pay attention to what everybody is saying, you know. And that could go for everybody who is uh, pontificating in front of people if you follow my drift. Uh, you know, let's let the experts figure it out. And then we'll go from there. And I'm not making a political statement there. I'm just making a I want to live statement, right? So, uh, you know, but I want to tell you something. Like I said, the blessing, one of the blessings, the silver lining of this is me me and my wife getting to babysit my grandson, uh, Owen. It's just, wow. I mean, what a, what a great time we, we've been having these weeks and uh, trying to stay safe, et cetera, but also giving my, my son and his, and his wife a, a, a chance to do their jobs at home. I mean <laughs> – I can't even imagine it. I mean, you're you're chasing liberty around. We talked about that last week, but uh, it, uh, it, I, I, you know, the daycare people earn their cash, right? Absolutely. If I ever wondered before what I, what my money was going for, uh, I understand it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Constant <laughs> surveillance. Well, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, that's the uh, Tim May podcast for yet another week. And like I said, we'll be back to talk about how Buckeyes went in the draft. What could be coming around the corner for Ohio State? What could be coming around the corner from a recruiting standpoint, et cetera, for Ohio State? As, as we proved on this show, once again, uh, going after four and five stars does have a payoff, and not just in the one, you know, not just in the prestige of uh, recruiting rankings, but payoff for teams rising from good to great. But until next week, for my buddy Boston, you know him as Austin Ward. This is Tim May. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. We got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buckeye Key with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics. We've got you covered here at Letterman Row.